Hi friends, my name is Tris, and this is No Boilerplate, focusing on fast, technical videos. Today I'm going to tell you how Rust helps us write code that has no execution paths that crash at runtime. This is a core pillar of Rust's fearless programming. Let's be real. Shit happens. The world is messy, and bad code, bad APIs, and bad data are everywhere. There's no way around errors. They are a fact of life. The only way we could avoid them is by not interacting with the real world. But if we write code that doesn't interact with the real world, that would mean doing no I.O. No output to the screen, no input from the keyboard. The only evidence that our program were running was that the box would get hotter. So just as in life, worthwhile interaction comes with the possibility of failure. As you know, exceptions are the common way to manage this. The first language to handle exceptions in a way we would recognise today was Lisp in 1958. I don't know why I was surprised by this fact when I looked it up. Basically, Lisp created everything we know as high-level programming today, and we're still learning the lessons 50 years later. A topic for another video, or a previous video, perhaps. Rust is getting very close. Nearly every language from the 1980s onwards copied exceptions. They have become standard in nearly every programming language. But they suck. Exceptions add a separate execution system outside the normal function call flow. You might not notice this if your language is stuffed full of classes, mix-ins, prototype trees, templates, and competing fashionable idioms. If there's already 10 ways to do things, what's adding one more to the mix? Let me make a clear argument. Go-tos are bad, right? Of course they are. Everyone agrees. Here's the thing. Go-tos are bad because they take you out of the normal flow of execution. Why do we allow exceptions, our error handling, to take us out of the normal flow of execution, but not allow go-tos to do so. Come to think of it, if errors are the inevitable byproduct of interacting with the real world, and programs that do useful work interact with the real world, why are errors called exceptions? Shouldn't they be expected? And here we have the central problem with exceptions. Errors are very normal, and acting like they're exceptional harms our ability to think about them and write robust complex distributed code. Luckily, we have a clear example from the world of mathematics. In mathematical functions, we work with just numbers, and our equations are either valid or they are not. They might be wrong, but they won't give us an unexpected null pointer exception instead of the number 2. Of course, unlike mathematicians, we live in the real world and must interact with the messy world with all of its humans and state and data loss. Here's some rust, finally. If we're never doing computation, like here, then we don't need errors. This function accepts any string and returns an integer, specifically the integer 42. You'll remember that most Rust integers are I32, which is a 32-bit signed integer. 32 bits is enough for most applications, and signed integers have fewer surprises than unsigned. This is why I32 is the Rust default when you don't specify a type, such as in ranges. But what if you want to do something that could fail, such as parsing that string to an integer? In other languages, this would be fine, because the function signature expresses the happy path, and an exception would break the flow and we could catch it somewhere else. Rust doesn't have exceptions. So if you write this, you are treated to one of Rust's excellent compiler errors. As usual, Rust has told us exactly the problem. I've lightly edited this error to fit on a slide. Rust's errors talk about types, because that is the language of the compiler. But we know what types mean, and we should talk about them in terms of their meaning. The error is expected i32 found result. The meaning is expected a number found a fallible number. Results are Rust's way of saying that you might not have what you wanted, there might be an error. And because errors are values, the type system can help us. Num.parse returns a result, which means we can't get at the number directly. There might have been an error. Let's tweak the function signature to fix this and pass the result back up. Rust encapsulates this fallibility in the result type, and the compiler can help you. You can't return an integer or an error. The type has to be one type only. But you can return a result enum that has two valid states, an integer or an error. Now the compiler is happy. And if the compiler is happy, I am happy. We have clearly stated in the function signature that you won't get an integer back from this function. You will get it wrapped in a result and you must handle it. Treating errors as just another value is one of the features of Rust that allows you to fearlessly write complex distributed systems confidently. An example of a company building large-scale complex distributed systems in Rust is today's sponsor, Ditto. 
Unlike other sponsors, Ditto don't want your money. They actually want to pay you. This is because they've asked me to tell you about open Rust positions at their company. Here's what you'll want to know about them, their tech, and their open positions. Ditto use Rust to power their cross-platform data sync system. They're growing their team and are looking for people passionate about Rust. If you're watching this video, that might be you. The problems they are solving include mesh networking, replication protocols, conflict-free replicated data types, and database design, to name a few. They're looking for people with demonstrable Rust experience or previous work with C and C++, Rust backend developers for their big peer cloud system, low-level bare metal coders working with FFI and C interop, algorithm junkies to work on their data stores, and networking coders at either the low or high level to work on their actor-like frameworks in replication and multi-hop work. Find out more about Ditto at ditto.live and see their open positions at ditto.live forward slash jobs. My thanks to Ditto for their support of this channel. Let's get back on the rails. You may have heard of this metaphor. It's one I found very useful when trying to understand functional errors like the result type in Rust. It was created by, and I will be borrowing a few slides from, Scott Voloshin in 2014. Each function is a set of points, and if there is a computation error, you divert the train from the happy path from which it can never recover. All future functions the error interacts with never execute any code, the payload continues uninspected through each station on its way to the destination. Only then do we need to find out what is inside with unwrap, expect, or preferably one of the many runtime safe methods. Let's build some error handling in Rust. I am basing this section on the code in the book Rust by Example. As ever, we start with modeling our data. We are going to implement a check math function to avoid panicking at runtime. Here, we are enumerating the three kinds of mathematics errors that we are going to be catching in our toy example. And here is how we are going to do that. Division by zero operations panic at runtime. Instead, let's return the reason for the failure wrapped in the er variant of the result enum. If the divisor y is not zero, then this operation is valid, and we return the result wrapped in OK. Note that we don't return the number, we still wrap it in the OK variant of the result enum. This stops calling code using the integer directly, which of course won't work if unexpectedly there is an error. Predictable return values are essential for good design in any language. The next time you attempted to return false or null from a function to signify a fail state, remember this. We'll write two more functions to do similar checked behavior, first on a square root function that errors on a negative number, and the same for natural log. Now let's put them together and test our train tracks. Here we have a function that uses our new math system we've just made. The check math function does some division, then square root, then log, and returns the answer. Note that the three calculations on line two to five use the question mark operator to unwrap the number inside the result, or if it is an error, immediately return it. This is the railway part of the function. Though not a track of functions accepting and returning results, as in the original railway-oriented design, this is functionally the same. As soon as you get an error, you early return it from the function. The last answer, answer 3 on line 5, if we get it, we want to repackage inside the OK variant of that result enum, so it can be returned in a type that is compatible with our function signature. If you have been paying attention, you will note that early returning from a function with an error sounds and looks an awful lot like exception handling. This is due to the question mark operator, one of Rust's excellent patterns, which deliberately makes this behavior familiar. But the difference is clear. All three of these functions can fail. But only Rust makes it clear to the compiler, and more importantly to you, that it can and will force you to handle the error. JavaScript is worse, and it can also return null instead of the number you hope to get. This is common across Python and Ruby too. This is my core feeling after programming professionally for 15 years. Tony Hoare, inventor of null in Algol in 1965, calls it his billion dollar mistake, as nearly every language has adopted it and perpetuated this misery. The core problem with null is that the type system must make a special case for it. You might expect a function to return a string, but surprise, you got a null. Rust's design helps you avoid runtime errors, but if you write code like this, you'll still get them. Making sure your code doesn't have any unwraps or expects gets you nearly all of the way there. But how can you defend against unchecked vector indexing, like in the second example? Well, you could set up a lint error for this, and Clippy can help you there. But friends, I have something very exciting to share with you. The no panic macro can give us this automatically. No panic is a Rust attribute macro that requires the compiler prove a function can't ever panic. I don't fully understand how it works, 
But by the message, I think it causes a compiler error if your code links to the panic handler function in the Rust standard library. This means if a single branch of your code unwraps a result unsafely, does unsafe runtime operations, or calls any crates that do so, no panic won't allow that function to compile. It's a bit hacky. The Git repo is archived, but I've tested it and it works. If you want to use it to prove important parts of your code, you can do so. Most languages start with null and have to build in controls for this terrible feature on top of it. Though Java now has options, null still exists in every popular library, hidden, waiting to strike at 4 a.m. TypeScript attempts to paper over the damage with its own option type, but it's too late for JavaScript too. These languages, along with Python and Ruby, infected their standard libraries and ecosystems with nulls years ago, and it's impossible to get the horse back in the stable after it has bolted. Even Go, an otherwise very good modern language, has nulls. Rust had no nulls from the start, so you can always get what you expect, and you can easily write code that never crashes. If you'd like to see what you can write in Rust, click the top video. I used it to make a fun retro computer visualization for my Hope Punk podcast, Lost Terminal. Or if urban fantasy is more your bag, click the bottom video to listen to a strange and beautiful podcast I produce called Modem Prometheus. If you would like to support my work, head to patreon.com forward slash no boilerplate. Transcripts and compile checked markdown source code are available on GitHub. Links in the description and corrections are in the pinned errata comment. Thank you so much for watching. Talk to you on Discord.